or lease from in the morning. Welcome to this episode of Director Showcase. I'm B Movie Paul. And I'm Phantom Dark Dave. And this week, as we continue Todd Browning Month, we'll be talking about his 1936 horror film, The Devil Doll. So, Dave, what did you think of The Devil Doll? I was surprised because I actually really like this movie. I um, I went into it very open-minded. Uh, you know, the trailer kind of throws you for a loop. You don't really know what to expect. But um, I liked it so much that I actually watched it twice um, just to make sure I, I stored it in my memory and that I caught everything that uh, the movie gives you. Um, I loved it because, you know, it's perfect length. It's not too long. And there really isn't a lot of dry spots. Like in this movie, there's always something going on, whether it's effects or story. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, this one was, um, it was a bit different from what I was expecting. When just the name Devil Doll, I was expecting like actual dolls coming to life. But the plot definitely surprised me. It was a lot more unique than that. Yeah, definitely. You know, you, um, there is no devil <laughs> in the movie. Yeah, uh, it's just used as a force of evil, I guess. You know, wrongdoings. But in the end, it's like there's a happy justice. Yeah, it was weird because the guy you think is the bad guy in the film turns out. I mean, he's not exactly a saint, but he's not really the bad guy. In fact, the guys who he's going after in this are really the bad guys. So it's definitely different. Um, yeah, I was surprised that there technically aren't any dolls in this movie. They're all these miniaturized people, which was really kind of a unique idea. Like, um, basically, according to IMDb, um, the only thing they have for it is an escaped convict uses miniature humans to wreak vengeance on those that framed him. And that kind of basically sums it up. But, like, yeah, he, the um, main character of the film, he manages, to, he escapes from jail, like they said, and go he happens to escape with this guy who had a a some kind of weird science project with his wife and they basically miniaturized people and they're trying to get it so that they wouldn't be um they'd be able to act on their own and it was very different to say the least yeah, and you know the main character uh, played by Lionel Barrymore, who's freaking awesome, by the way, yeah, just astounding. I, I which was... I, I, I was gonna say that it should come to as no surprise, but I, I still was just really impressed with his work. But um, the main character's name is Paul. That, that wasn't you, was it? Actually, I was thinking that the whole time. Like, hey, I'm in this <laughs> movie, but yeah, that's another point for this movie. The main character's name is Paul, so. But yeah, like you said, he um, he breaks out of prison with a kind of a friend of his who's a we'll call him a mad scientist because he was a crazy looking dude. His name was Marcel. And when they go back to their lab and you meet his wife, it's really funny because they're playing these roles like like they're God, right? Like um, mad scientist. He he's like a Doctor Frankenstein. And she, did you notice her hair? It doesn't stand up like Marge Simpson, but yeah, it but still looks like Bride of Frankenstein. It's got the streak and everything. So that was that was a really cool just, you know, play on play. But um, all the acting in this movie was good. I, I was really impressed. And there was a few things they, they said that kind of made me laugh. You know, the hot broth, hot broth. What's the matter with you? Like so disrespectful to um, the girl who's kind of the um, – I don't know what you call her, I guess the maid of the house, you know, the young girl who they end up turning into a, a doll, quote unquote. But, you know, the reason they call it the doll is because, like Paul said, they they shrink human beings. And what happens is when, when you're sh when you what's the proper <laughs> I'm a writer. I can't even say it when you're shrunk or when you've shrunk and how you say your memory is kind of erased and you can't do anything. So the only thing you do is by command. And so the goal is to shrink a human and then have them a fully substantial brain. And um, that kind of turns out to, to play off of itself because when Marcel dies, he's kind of the mad scientist guy. His wife wants to continue the work. And instantly, Paul, not B-movie Paul, but Paul, he he's like, nah, that's probably not the best idea. And she's like, look, we can go to Paris. And immediately that hits home with Paul because 
the people who framed him are in Paris. And so instantly he's like, I can seek revenge on these people using these dolls. She can get what she wants. I get what I want. It's perfect. It's kind of like a a weird Sweeney Todd relationship in a way. That's a good point. That's a good comparison too. It's yeah. Like they have their own like plans for it, and, but it kind of they kind of coincide, so it works out well, sort of and, until the end of the film. And how about the um, the Bible references? You know, the they're in the restaurant and they get a note and it has all these Bible verses for them to read and they're like, what the heck is this? And, you know, they go home and it, it's like confess and be saved and that's when kind of you're talking about the bad guy is not really the bad guy. That's when it starts to stand out. It's like he doesn't necessarily want to kill these people. He just wants to prove his innocence. Yeah. And a lot of it was he wanted to prove his innocence for his daughter because she he didn't want her thinking that he was a murderer and a thief. So, like, he's intentions were ultimately pretty noble like he like right from the get-go he comes off as seeming like a bad guy but he's actually pretty good overall i was quite surprised by that a lot of depth to the character yeah he, he's driven by pure motivation and um he, he is trying to make right with his daughter because she hates him like she disowns him and hates him because she thinks that he's this bad guy who did these really awful things and you know left her behind and um, that's when you notice he's just like this, I don't know what, how you describe it, but he has a con- contagious smile. Like, he just looks so nice and so just like, oh, the dad you've never had, you know, type character. But, oh, it's so cool because, you know, the humans shrink and they pose as dolls because you're not commanding them to move. So they don't move. They look like a doll. So they try to take each one of these dolls into the homes and uh, of the people who framed him and he would be recognizable except for the fact that he dresses like an old lady this is like pre miss doubtfire stuff right here yeah i was thinking that this movie's basically mrs doubtfire crossed with the uh, small soldiers and there's no run by fruiting with pierce brosnan either but um and i think that's another thing i was looking at i was like wow like lionel barrymore is a good actor and he's a good actress <laughs> Yeah, he he pulled that <laughs> he off. He did really good. <laughs> and I'm of course, thinking, like how how can they not know this is this is a guy in it? But I'm like, you know, if I was in that situation, would I believe it? You know, I think I might have. Yeah, if you, I, I would dare somebody, and, and I say this, if you walked in on the movie in this scene and you saw this old lady talking, I bet you wouldn't know right away it was Lionel Barrymore. Yeah, it's like, oh, excuse me, ma'am. You know, anyone ever tell you you look kind of like Lionel Barrymore? It's like. <laughs> Oh, I get that all the time, Sonny. <laughs> oh, man. Um, he played it up so well. Like, at one point when the uh, police are interrogating him, he's like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. Me, a little old lady. What will the neighbors think? It was, it was, it was so believable. Yeah, he, um, he was but fantastic with that. How about the effects, though? I mean, we're talking about... Paul, this is the 1930s, man. Yeah. They, they really did look like... They had huge sets and huge props and... I, some of it I still don't really know how they did it but I, I was totally into the story like it didn't look that fake to me it was bizarre because like it was it was clear that like at least nowadays they were putting one clip on top of another but they worked it so well that it looks like there is a little person there it was kind of cool especially like the scene where you see the dogs on top of the table and the big dog like jumps on the side it, that was really cool looking it's like they especially like you said for the time period i don't i don't think there were many films doing that it's kind of like a reverse of the um attack of the 20 foot like something it was like you know here's like attack of the less than a foot tall person yeah and um actually my favorite scene in the movie is when the dolls are dancing on the table that is creepy looking it's in the trailer but um what was her name melita She's the Bride of Frankenstein is what I call her. <laughs> she's like standing there all wide-eyed, just kind of like creepy. And she's watching. There's like a music box that's open and playing. And the dolls are just swinging around and dancing on the table. And with the kind of music that's playing and the way they're dancing, it just – it's so eerie, you know, because you're just like, that's weird, man. <laughs> it's kind of like a voodoo thing going on. Pretty much. I got to say, the woman who played her was – did really well 
well as well. Uh, Maureen O'Sullivan, I believe her name was, she did really well being this creepy kind of like mad scientist woman trying to continue on her late husband's um, weird ex experiments. And, you know, she's not really a bad person. She has noble intentions, but she's also insane like her husband was. Like, it's so weird, like, because they're talking about at the beginning their, what they want to do um, with the um, shrinking formula. They want to shrink down all people so that, you know, we would have more food. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a terrible idea because... Yeah, you'd have more food, but it would also take, like, that much more effort to make anything, and it, it just wouldn't end up working out very well. And, like, okay, these guys are... But they kind of recognize the fact that those people were insane, that their plan is insane. And uh, Paul's character is like, well, okay, well, I'm going to use this for my thing. Um, you guys can do that later. <laughs> yeah, and with that being said, I think that points the finger to Melita... Am I saying that right, Melita? Yeah, being she's the bad guy. Yeah, okay. because after he's done and he's satisfied, she's like, "Awesome, let's keep going." He's like, "No, I, I, I did what I needed to do. I don't want to hurt people anymore. We're good." And she's like, "No, no, um, you know, my husband died. He would want us to continue." And she threatens to like kill both of them if he doesn't do it. And she's a lunatic. Yeah, that was pretty intense. I was like, "Wait a minute." Is this how this is gonna end? Like she's gonna blow them both up? Like, but yeah, she was she was a wild card in that. I was really not sure what to expect with that, but I was impressed. Her acting was really good. I thought for a second they were gonna turn into dolls. I was like, oh no. Yeah, that's what I thought originally. She was planning. She's like, um, because she has the one like little doll person like go after him, and I'm like, oh, is he gonna be turned into a doll? Like, you know, I kind of felt bad because he's like about to make things right with his daughter, but. It's like, okay, he managed to stop that in the end, but, like, yeah, she was she was nuts, but, man, what a great character. Like, I originally thought it was just going to be her and her husband, and they were going to, like, turn um, Paul's character into a doll, because I, I knew nothing about this going into it, but I'm like, okay, they're going to a different direction with that. So it's not the mad scientist movie, it's more of a mad scientist meets um guy trying to get revenge on these guys who did him wrong kind of film. So definitely a unique idea, to say the least. Yeah, and you know, I do have a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit experience with Todd Browning films, and that's something that he always does. And think about some movies that we've already talked about and some movies that we're going to be talking about. Todd Browning is really good about presenting some random ass story, but then really just putting some icing on the cake in the end and really summing it up. You know, you think of, you know, how Dracula ended, and then, um, this next movie that we're going to be doing, um, when you finally see it, you'll see the same thing at the end, too. I mean, Todd Browning, he just does that at the end, you know? And I really love the end of this movie because, I mean, it makes you really happy, which is great for this kind of movie to end happy. <laughs> oh, definitely. It ties together so well. Like, um, I use spoilers um, for anyone who hasn't seen this. Um, yeah, basically at the end, uh, Paul, his, he's... Um, he gets to the guys who set him up to admit that they set him up and everything. And he um, basically kind of leaves things for his daughter to um, live her life and then kind of leaves because he's going to, if he comes out like um, oh, from hiding, they're going to question him on where the three guys, what ha what happened with the three guys. So, Or at least the two of them. He paralyzed one and I think he turned another one to a doll or something like that. And... Yeah, so he's like, he can't, like, be around his family because then they'll be, like, in constantly, like, interrogated and things like that. So he kind of leaves it there, and it was a nice ending. You realize that he actually was a good guy after all, and it was, um... It, it tied everything together, because for a while, like, you could see him, at, like, just the way he acts. Like, this could be a bad guy or a good guy. It's like, his, he just kind of has that that array of him, like, around him where it's like... He might be planning something devious, or he might be doing something, like, noble. And I was kind of glad that it ended up being more noble in the end. Yeah, he really showed his humane character with that. And, um, you know, I, I say no regard to the idea that it's possibly a spoiler. Because if someone asked me, why should I watch this movie? I would say, watch it for the effects. Watch what they were able to accomplish in 1936. 
And watch it for the performances. Everybody did such a great job in this movie. Definitely. And even, like, saying what happened at the end, like, it's kind of like you said, you have to see it. It's just very heartwarming. It really ties everything together. The only thing I was a little disappointed with was um, he says to um, his daughter's, um, I don't know if it was her fiancé or just uh, her boyfriend, like, um, when he asks, like, where are you going, he goes, I'm... Oh, she, he says, he says, like, I can send you money. He goes, where I'm going, I'm not going to need money. It's like, well, I don't really know where he's going, and I kind of want to know where he's going. Like, I mean, in a I way know. it's kind of good, because it's like, you know, it kind of leaves some mystery with that. But at the same point, I'm like, I, I kind of want to know if he's not going to stay with them. Where is he going? Like, Yeah, he's like, where I'm going, I don't need money. I'm like, dude, you sound like you're going into a bathtub with a toaster. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Well, there, Oof, there's a you just... he's, he says, like, um... He says, um, well, my plan, it does end with me dying, but not just yet. And I'm like, oh, well, so what are you doing, man? Like, I, I want to know. You can't just end it like that. And another good point is this entire end sequence that's so happy that we're talking about. It takes place on top of the Eiffel Tower, which is really awesome. Oh, yeah. That was, um, that was perfect. I know this is Todd Browning month, and he did a great job, but I really tip my hat to Lionel Barrymore in here. And I did a lot of research about just him as an actor and things he's accomplished and the gazillion things he's associated with. I mean, everybody knows he's, you know, It's a Wonderful Life and Grand Hotel and, you know, a few other things. But um, he's the great uncle of Drew Barrymore. I mean, Barrymore, Barrymore. People will pick up on that for sure. He, um, I read he invented the boom microphone. <laughs> did he? <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? Like the boom microphone? So that's cool. Thank you, Lionel. Yeah, I'm safe. Um, whenever I use one of those, I'm going to have to thank him every time. And then um, something kind of like, oh, to think about. This movie came out in 1936. Two years later, he was put permanently in a wheelchair. And he spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair, still acting. I mean, still being, you know, they were so great to, to keep him in Hollywood um, I'm sure because he's just an upstanding gentleman and he does a great job but all his characters from there on out were written with disabilities just so he could play them and I just thought that was really commendable definitely and really who else could play like such a great character I'm sure they were like they wanted to work with him too alright now I'm going to say something if you didn't research this it's totally cool I'd love to be the one to tell you this yeah, okay. he was a pallbearer for Lon Chaney how awesome is that Huh, that's really cool. Like, that's just, you know, keeping everything so close. Lon Chaney, Todd Browning, Lionel Barrymore, and, uh, man, just to know they were that close, that's really awesome, you know. Definitely. Good people. But that's another thing I noticed about Todd Browning, too, is that he recycles his cast a lot. There was a, If you like people uh, in some movies, odds are you're going to see them in others. Yeah, he definitely like, seemed to have a good relationship with a lot of his uh, cast members. I have to ask you, if you didn't say it already, is there anything you must nitpick about this film? Um, okay, the only other complaint, which isn't a complaint, is something I found funny, was the whole movie takes place in France, yet no one has a French accent. I, I just <laughs> thought that was really funny. Like, they have French names, they like, um, clear, they're on the Eiffel Tower, they're talking about France, and yet everyone has, like clearly american accents in fact i think i have, there are a bunch of new york accents at least more than like french accents i'm like couldn't even fake the french accent guys like but i love the film but i just thought that was really funny that takes place in france yet for no reason except to say it took place in france that's true i actually i was so into the movie i missed that but now that you brought it to my attention you're probably gonna make it stand out every time so thank you for that but um doesn't ruin it for me definitely it's such a cool movie i have to say i'm not much of a nitpicker but there was two things in this movie that stood out to me one they couldn't help and like i said the way they did the technology like you said doing print on top of print and everything's so cool but when they have to like pretend they're looking at something that's not really there a lot of the times they missed <laughs> Yeah. Like when they're holding the quote unquote doll in their hand, I'm like, you are clearly looking way over your hand. <laughs> I didn't let it bother me, but I thought about the nitpicking. I'm like, I'm going to bring that up. 
Yeah, it's definitely noticeable, but it's also like you kind of see because now that stuff is done so much that like it's um it's kind of fun you seeing people seeing like back when like that was such a new thing like there's um it's it's always interesting watching like old old movies where they'll have like a person talking to a cartoon that's not there like way before like who framed roger rabbit or anything like that like old black and white ones and it's like it's so weird because like the you can tell the person like talking to the cartoons like i know like i know i'm supposed to be looking here but this is really weird (laughs) (laughs) the other thing it's not a huge deal but the in sequence where lady goes crazy and she's like i'm gonna break this bottle and blow us up and break us down to particles and all that she throws it it is like the loudest explosion like the most dramatic fire spread and it's like this little which i don't know anything about mixing chemicals and making explosions not into it but oh my did they did the bass get so loud it was like a huge like you would think a building came down and oh she was break some glass one thing I thought that was funny about that was like she throws it and then like um, there's an explosion and it stops for a second he goes are you okay and suddenly fire goes oh crap and suddenly more fire and the whole place is down and like it was the most delayed like ex- like destruction ever but it was I mean it was entertaining to say the least yeah it didn't detract from the film but I just stood it out as kind of comical oh yeah just so. seemed like um, somebody writing it it's like well first there's an explosion is that it? Well, no. Then there's then there's fire. Okay. Well, then there's more fire. Okay. Add more fire. <laughs> it's like, it's frame by frame. That was right. Weird. But yeah, yeah. Overall, like really good film. I was impressed with it. It was a lot different from what I was expecting, but I thought that that they did a good job with it. The directing was great. The writing was great, and the acting was really really good. I think the acting was overall the best part of it. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. The uh, the story was a really cool concept, but it was really brought to life by the people involved. So, so you ready to rate this thing? Yeah, so um, why don't you go first with your rating? What would you give this out of a score from 1 to 10? 1 to 10, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bend a little bit, and I'm going to go 7.5. Nice. I'm going to give this a solid 7. Yep, 7 out of 10 for me, and 7.5 for you, yeah. Ultimately, like, this is one of the better films I've seen in a while. I was impressed with the story, the acting, and I'm really starting to really like Todd Browning. So. Yeah, and, and it's a story like this that you're only going to get in some kind of Todd Browning universe. Um, nothing like this is going to be considered an A movie today. You know, similar to some of the podcasts you guys have done recently, some of the interviews of what makes a B-movie a B-movie, and a lot of it lies in being able to just have a story where you think outside the box, and this definitely is is parallel to that. So, love this story. Thought it was really well done, and um, I'll definitely be watching it again. Definitely. The only weird thing is, um, so this was labeled a horror movie and something, and like um, IMDb and things like that, but it really wasn't that horror-like. I mean, you know, I will say, like, the idea of people getting shrunk down and not having their own, like, control of their mind, to me, that's terrifying. Like, that was really freaky to me, but I don't think it's really much of a horror film. I mean, I guess it kind of can. I mean, it is people doing human experiments, so that's pretty creepy, but... And there was a, a scene where, you know, one of the miniature humans was wielding a knife and crawling in somebody's bed. I mean, that's kind of horrifying. That's true, yeah. I guess, like, it does, it, I can definitely see where, where it would be considered a horror film, like, I think it's, like, more of a horror, I mean, so it's a thriller, like. Would you call it suspense? Yeah, that, that'd probably be a horror suspense film, so, yeah, works for me. All right. Cool. So, for next week, we will be continuing Todd Browning Month, and the movie we shall be seeing for that will be The Unknown, starring your favorite actor, Lon Chaney. 1927 Lon Chaney and Joan Crawford nice so that'll be fun so yes finally a Todd Browning film with Lon Chaney it's only took us three weeks to get to this point so next week that will be our review so until next time be brave be alive and be back for more 
Ronnie. Oh, I'm seeing Ronnie.